So, good morning to those people in London. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those people who are joining us online. Absolute pleasure to have you here. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this conference. My name is Linda Amran Cooper, and I'm Director of the Centre for Online and Distance Education at the University of London. It's lovely to see people in the room and to know that we have people online with us as well. My Vice Chancellor has asked me to uh, send her apologies. She's not able to join us at this, this morning for the first introduction and the welcome. She does extend a welcome, but she's asked me to cover that for her. She will be here later on with us. So, so welcome to the University of London, to Senate House, and to our 17th annual international conference, Research in Distance Education, Sustaining Innovation. Welcome to the online audience and to those in Senate House. So the conference is coordinated by the Centre for Online and Distance Education at the University of London. The Centre for Online and Distance Education, formerly known as CDE, now known as CODE, um, is a community of experts, thought leaders, et cetera, in the field of online, distance, open and technology enhanced education. We're drawn from across the University of London, member institutions and more widely from the UK and internationally. Now in its second, 22nd year, the Centre for Online and Distance Education includes 42 fellows with leading expertise in online education. We support a range of communities of practice, special interest groups, and work closely with stakeholders to foster innovation, solve challenges, evaluate research and support capacity building and training. But our communities are wider than just those within the center. We are currently hosting three visiting fellows from the Open University China, who are here with us today, and a number of colleagues from Nigeria who are here with us in the room and online, who joined us last week for a three-day workshop and symposium. You're welcome to be here, all of you. Additionally, we have 20 code student research fellows, several of whom are presenting at our conference today and tomorrow. And I'm particularly proud of that, that we have our students with us. The theme of the conference, as I mentioned, is sustaining innovation, research and practice. Rapid and extensive innovation development and expansion of the role of blended online and distance learning has transformed higher education in the last few years. Few, I think, is what we're all thinking. These changes have introduced opportunities for new ways of working for all involved, but have also placed pressures and stresses on students, staff, systems and technology. Today and tomorrow, we will explore how people-focused practices have and can be designed and developed through innovation that is sustainable for people, organizations, and the planet. We are running this as a fully hybrid conference taking place across the two days. Today, day one has a focus on research and tomorrow our focus is on practice. I suspect the lines are quite blurred though, so please make sure you enjoy all of it. I'm delighted that we have such a rich and varied program across both days with 48 presentations, workshops, and lightning talks to engage with. There will be the opportunities for in-depth discussion and exploration of the rapidly evolving practice of online and distance education. We have two World Cafe events stimulated by keynote inputs. These interactive events will provide the opportunity for debate and sharing of ideas in two very topical areas, artificial intelligence and blended learning. Included in our programme, we have two special events happening today. The Roger Mills Prize for Innovation and Learning and Teaching will be awarded later today. And we close our first day of the conference this evening with the launch of the Centre for Online and Distance Education's new book, Online and Distance Education for a Connected World. We welcome the presenters with us today and tomorrow, some in person, others online. All have been selected to present through the rigorous work of our conference committee 
And my thanks go to the Code Events and Conference Committee, plus the Code Research and Scholarship teams for the excellent conference programme. My special thanks also go to the Code Centre officers, Mark Beasley and Jennifer Lamb Morrison, who you met outside at the desk. I wish you a very successful conference and that the conference theme of sustaining innovation does indeed sustain you in your work over the next months and years. So that's the introductions. I'm going to start now by moving us into our first keynote session, which um, when we planned this just before Christmas or around, around November, um, I don't think we could have thought about how much was going to rapidly evolve and change. Um, so I think it's going to be a very stimulating uh, session, which probably leaves us with plenty of questions and engagement to think about further. So Professor Mike Sharples is with us today. Welcome, Mike. Mike is Emeritus Professor of Educational Technology at the Open University UK. His expertise involves human-centred design and evaluation of new technologies and environments for learning. As academic lead for the Future Learn company, he led the design of its social learning approach. He is associate editor of the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence in Education. He founded the Innovating Pedagogy Report Series and is author of over 300 papers in the areas of educational technology, learning sciences, science education, human-centered design of personal technologies, artificial technology, intelligence and cognitive science. So it's a really warm welcome to Mike, who's going to lead us through some interesting thoughts and discussion opportunities around artificial intelligence. Let's welcome Mike. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for inviting me. The, the main reason I'm here today is that my um, PhD topic at the University of Edinburgh was on AI and creative writing. And now, 40 years later, it's come back to bite me. As Linda said, at the moment, things are changing very rapidly. And I've given this talk a few times before, and every time I do this, it seems to be out of date. So I hope I'm reasonably up to date. So I'm going to be talking on generative AI for academic writing and assessment. And I guess all of you will have heard in one form or another about generative AI. Chat GPT is the main example at the moment. What I want to do is just start with a um, postgraduate student essay. And I just want you to have a look at that just for a couple of minutes and think if you were assessing this student essay, what sort of mark would you give it? Um, let's say it's a master's in education. And what sort of comments, what sort of feedback would you give to the student? I'll give you a couple of minutes just to look at it because I'm going to be using that as an example. As you've probably guessed, this essay was entirely generated by AI. So <clears throat> this student essay was generated by an AI program, ChatGPT. And I gave it the prompt that you can, I hope you can read at the back, read down there. You're a student on a Master of Education course. Write a high quality 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence for research studies. It should begin the construct of learning styles is problematic because, and that's all the information I gave it. And then I pressed the submit button on GPT and it generated that entire essay, including the citations and the references at the end. What is this thing? Well, the latest version is called GPT-4 and it's a highly trained text completer and style copier. So you've got a version of that on your mobile phone you type in some words and it continues the sentence. But this is a, a souped up, a hugely souped up version. It's been trained on millions of documents, billions of words, roughly the entire textual internet. And now the latest version can generate up to 25,000 words. So it can generate an entire dissertation, 50 page dissertation. It can write in any style, in multiple languages, including minority languages, say Welsh. It can be given a direct instruction, as you see, 
And it, the latest version can also interpret text and images. So you can see just down there on the bottom right side, um, a exam paper in French, as it happens, um, with a diagram, and it can you know, answer that exam question, including interpret diagrams. So it's a general purpose language tool. Um, and ChatGPT is a conversational agent based on um, the one most of you may have had access to is GPT 3.5 and now GPT 4. So you can converse with it in um, a normal language, English language or other languages. Uh, and it holds a very natural conversation. So uh, I'm having a conversation on the right about with it about plagiarism in AI. Uh, and I said, um, how would I know the source of information since it's been trained on millions of texts? That it refers back to the previous context, the source of information. It has been trained on millions of, of texts. It knows what I mean. It continues the conversation in a natural way. So that's what it is. The first thing to note is that um, if a student had uh, used ChatGPT to generate that essay, plagiarism detectors don't work because the text is generated, not copied. If you search or use any sentence from that, uh, that student essay um, and you put it into Google search, you won't find a source. So normal plagiarism detectors don't work. You may have heard that some companies are now um, starting to release AI uh, detectors. And so you've got this strange kind of um, uh, arms race between AI generators and AI detectors. Um, OpenAI itself um, has released the detector tool, partly because it wants to just put it out there for people to use. And um, OpenAI has done a fairly um, large survey um, of the use of that detector tool, and it labels about nearly 10% of human written texts as being written by AI. In other words, false positives. So one in 10, it gets wrong. One in 10 human written text, it says is AI. The Turnitin company that you may well have heard of, um, the markets, the, the brand leading plagiarism detector, now has its own AI based detector. It claims less than 1% false positives, so less than one in a hundred um, actual student generate student written essays misclassifying as AI generated. However, that was based on GPT-3, not the more recent GPT-4, and it needs to be independently verified. Um, it also works by getting this, each student to submit a sample of their writing. And so it's matching the student's writing against the AI. And of course, student writing changes. If you have a different assignment, a um, uh, student may well write in a different style. So you have to treat these claims about uh, successive AI detectors with something at the moment of a pinch of salt. But just to go back to that essay, <laughs> right in the middle of it, so I went and you know, it was generated by AI, I checked all of the references. And right in the middle of that so-called student essay is a completely invented research study. It says, in tracking, learners are sorted into groups based on their perceived learning style, which can reinforce stereotypes and limit opportunities for growth and exploration. Gurung, 2004. Well, I searched for that uh, academic paper, Gurung, 2004, black and white thinking about learning styles, a response to the Journal of College Reading and Learning. There is a journal, College of Reading and Learning, but there is no paper by um, Gurung 2004 about that. It is a completely invented paper. And the research study that it cites is completely invented. So why should an AI system invent a research study in a paper? The answer is that it is not a database. It is a language machine. It is not looking up facts. It is doing what I asked it to do, which is to generate plausible language. 
So we need to be very clear about this, that it will sometimes, maybe not often, but sometimes entirely make up facts, including inventing research studies and doing it in a very plausible way. So the phrase that's been used, a word that's been used is hallucinate. Generative AI hallucinates. It doesn't know that it shouldn't invent research studies because it has no inbuilt explicit model of how the world works. It doesn't know that academics are not supposed to um, generate fake research. And it can't access current information. So it was trained up to September 2021. There has been some uh, post training after that, but the main data, the main resource that it uses is uh, up to September 2021. And in human terms, it's amoral. It doesn't know what's right and what's wrong because it's a language machine, not a database or a reasoning system. And to, to its credit, the OpenAI company make this quite clear. Um, if you go to its website, there's a blog there that says limitations. Despite making significant progress, our Instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic or biased outputs, make up facts and generate sexual and violent content without explicit prompting. So the OpenAI company recognizes the limitations of its system. What should we do? Should we ban it? Well, some universities are already taking that route. But I think the problem is that confident students will continue to use AI and many, you know, not just thousands, but millions of students are already using AI to generate their essays and assignments. And the confident students will continue to use it and will challenge decisions based on AI detectors because they know that AI detectors are not fully reliable. And it's just um, the university will have to say, well, I think my piece of technology is better than that piece of technology. Um, so I think banning it is going to lead to all kinds of both legal challenges, but also ethical dilemmas. Do we try to evade it by having um, uh, oral examinations or invigilated examinations? For high stakes exams, that may well be needed, but they're costly and limited. So I think we're going to have to adapt. And that adapt adaptation requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines. But let's look at the other side of it. Generative AI can be an empowering and a joyful tool for creativity. Um, and for those of you at the front who can read it, um, on the right hand side is a lesson plan that I wrote for a 90 minute introduction to Spanish for beginners aimed at children aged 10 and formatting the lesson plan as a markdown table, as a table. And it produced an entire lesson plan. And, it, uh, and then I, um, with the chat interface, I said, make the lesson plan more fun and engaging. And then it redid that entire table um, to make it more engaging. So you can not only ask it to perform tasks, but you can then have a dialogue with it about refining those tasks. Here are some possibilities on how you could use generative AI in a more positive way. Firstly, the educator or the student uses AI to generate multiple responses to an open question. So you set it a question and then either you as the educator or the student generates multiple responses. And then each student synthesizes and critiques those AI responses to produce their own written answer. Uh, and the way in which you phrase that prompt um, may well alter the way in which the AI produces its response. So you can experiment with that. The second possibility, an educator sets a project for the students and each student uses generative AI as a tool for research. So um, the student then is given the project. Um, so for example, uh, I would um, chat GPT asked, um, what could be um, the use of AI in the professional workplace? And it came back with a list of four possibilities. And then I said, please give evidence from research studies that support these conclusions. And it came back with a response. Again, you have to be very careful. You need to check each of those responses, each of those pieces of evidence. 
but it can be used as a research tool. And then the student writes a project report indicating the contribution of AI. And the third, and I think this is the one I like the most, is using it as a respondent in a dialogue. So you have a Socratic dialogue um, with ChatGPT. You take a position in an argument and you ask it to act as a responder. And the, um, so you, uh, and the example I gave here was asking it, um, which of these two economic models, the US or the Chinese economic model is likely to be more successful in the short or medium term. And I had a fascinating sort of 20 minute discussion, 20 minute argument um, with uh, the chat GPT, with it acting as a respondent, rebouncing ideas off it. So I think you, know, you can either imagine the students doing this individually or as a group where you have a discussion with it and then you write an essay based on that argument, based on that discussion with the AI. So start to wrap up now. First thing is use generative AI with care. We will need to rethink written assessment. Um, probably we'll need to rethink it very quickly um, for high stakes assessment, whether we're going to move towards oral examinations, whether we're going to move to invigilated examinations. Um, and you can be sure that, you know, if not a majority, certainly a large minority of students will already be, be using um, AI to support their writing because of fear of missing out. Um, they don't want to be the one that has a low quality essay um, or that fails to meet a deadline because they didn't use AI. Beware of AI for factual writing. As I say, and I'll stress again, it is not a database. It is a language generator. Explore AI for creativity, for argumentation and research. There are many possibilities and many opportunities. And I should say that for myself, the breakthrough came with um, uh, GPT-4 about two weeks ago. And since then, I have been routinely using it to do things like help me to generate presentations. Um, I had to write a foreword for a book a couple of days ago, and I wrote my first draft with GPT-4. I didn't, um, almost all of it I didn't use, but it gave me a starting point. So we need to develop AI literacy. And I know you're going to be discussing this at your tables, some of you, so I'd like you to think about what an AI literacy rather than a computer literacy might be, and to introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff. So there is emerging policy. Um, the Mills has produced a really good um, website that is very much work in progress, trying to collect together as many resources as she can, um, blogs, but research papers, and also sample policy statements uh, about text generators. And here is just a brief digest of some of them. So as I said, you will need to um, amend exam questions or written assessments to make them harder for AI to generate. Uh, for example, by uh, requiring students to incorporate up-to-date information in their, um, in their assignment. Establish guidelines for students and staff and use the generative AI. And I'll give you an example in the next slide. Explain to students how they should acknowledge the use of generative AI in assignments. And I think this is much more difficult than you might think because um, also, as I'm going to say, it is being embedded already into office tools. So Microsoft is embedding generative AI into its office tools. And you know, as we all know, as you write, the spell checker um, highlights um, words that need to be revised or phrases that need to be revised. Soon, um, your office tool will say, do you want to generate a bit more? you might generate an extra sentence. Should the student have to acknowledge each time they press that generate a bit more button? Have a think about it. We'll man need to manage suspected breaches of the guidelines and how do we do that if the student challenges and consider redesigning assessment for the next academic year. So these are some examples of emerging policy, not just from the UK, but worldwide. And here's a set of guidelines um, for students on best practices for using generative AI systems in education. 
And I should acknowledge I, these guidelines were produced with the assistance of chat GPT um, and GPT-4 because it did a better job than I could uh, on those guidelines. And I'm very happy to circulate these slides later so that you can look at them in more detail. And I can come back to this slide if you want to. So what next? Well, as I mentioned, Microsoft is already integrating um, generative AI into its office suite. So you will be able to just um, give an instruction of uh, write me a um, 20 slide talk for um, the University of London on generative AI. You'll press the button and it will produce the entire slide set. Um, and that's just the start. There will be many, many uses um, in all of its office tools for generative AI. There will be AI generated video blogs and courses. And I've got a link there to um, an example of some uh, a company that has entirely generated a um, short uh, video presentation. Uh, it's on uh, how to cook a pancake, but um, it generated his voice. It generated um, his visual appearance. Um, it generated the entire text and it generated video inserts. So it can generate an entire um, now piece of video instruction. And that already exists. AI personal guides and tutors. So Khan Academy um, is now starting to embed AI into its tutoring system. Duolingo for teaching languages now has a version that can use AI as a respondent to help you practice your language. And lastly, topical generative AI. So um, OpenAI two days ago um, released uh, what it calls plugins. And so now you are able to plug into ChatGPT a whole set of extras, which will take stock market reports, which will plan um, your holiday for you, that will link up to Expedia and to other resources. So if you like, generative AI is broken out of its shell. It's now interacting with the entire world for um, and everything in terms of the excitement opportunities and risks and dangers that that poses. So topical generative AI is also here. And uh, I did go back, that essay that I showed at the start was generated with um, chat GPT 3.5. I tried it with GPT 4 and it's much improved. <clears throat> if I read that essay, I couldn't find anything wrong with it, um, including the references. They were all accurate and correct. So you can expect now that students will be submitting assignments generated with ChatGPT4 that you really couldn't tell that they were written by AI. And if you want to find out more, and a colleague, Rafael Perez and Perez, who spent the last 30 years working in the area of um, story generators, and myself wrote a book. We Happily wrote it just as GPT-3 was coming on stream. So it includes a lot about GPT-3 uh, and other similar story generators, but also the rich history and future predictions for what it means to have AI as a story machine, as a story generator. So that's all I have to say. I, I hope you have you know, some really stimulating discussion. And then uh, I think at the end, we're going to come back and have a plenary session. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, right, so what's going to happen now is that we are going to have um, discussions in the room and discussions online. Initial questions that we got in, we can refer to, but actually many of them, I think, were to some extent picked up in the prompts at the table, so there were some good discussions. So I'd like to invite, if I may, reflections from the room. We will use the microphone and um, just to ensure that people online can hear us. Any comments or reflections or questions from within the room, here or online? Thank you. 
genuine panic and concern that you know, not just us but everybody worldwide this is a worldwide issue um last week uh, i was at a russell group um, meeting and there was a student panel and it was very interesting to hear the students that um, firstly they said they were using it um you know, all of them were using it because all of their friends were and because of you know, it's like us they wanted to try out to see what it could do but also they were genuinely looking for guidance. And they were asking, you know, what should we do? How should we behave? So I do think in the short term, we need to offer guidance, but we also need to, you know, to rise above the immediate issues and the um, immediate concerns. And for years, we've been saying, there are certain skills and abilities students need to have. They need to have um, you know, skills in terms of being able to critique being able to engage in a, a structured argument. Um, we need to provide more rapid feedback to students. AI tools could help with all of these. And I think if instead of saying, you know, how do we assess student ethics, we think about what sort of new skills are possible augmented by AI, and how can we then um, work with students, not against them, but work with students to try and develop these augmented skills these higher level critical skills, then I think that's a much more promising opportunity for education than just trying to uh, look at it as a challenge we have to overcome. Matt, I think you've got a question from, on, from the online audience. The light should be off. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so this is from David Vaughan. Um, so he's just mentioned that we felt that keeping policy up to date will be tough. Um, so somebody was suggesting that we may need to use AI to keep our updates. Thoughts on more of the burden that it's got on that one? Yes, I mean, so as I've said, just about every week now I'm giving a talk, and um, I have been using AI to not not write these slides, I should say, but to help me keep um, up to date and to refine my thinking. Um, so. I'm, so the way I'm using these tools already is to bounce ideas off them. Uh, so, you know, for instance, with the guidelines, um, I started to write a set of guidelines, and then I thought, well, let's see what GPT-4 would come up with. And it phrased them in a way that helped my thinking, and also phrased it in a more succinct way than I could have written. So I think we we can use these tools to keep up to date now again there is a big proviso that um they were trained up to 2021 so they won't have you know, any of the recent debate and discussion that has to come from us but to help us to clarify our thinking um i think they could be valuable well, thank you david thank you. any further comments or questions from the room thanks a couple of of, sort of thoughts. Uh, firstly, is this a calculator moment? Uh, you know, we, we, some of us will be 
remember when it was the end of the and that was the end of the mass teaching of students who used to be interested in their science, et cetera, et cetera, and how I get, uh, you know, ubiquitous. Um, the other one of the other things that came back was, uh, you know, is chat people generative AI effectively the sort of McDonald's of the world? So you get a major response that is, you know, pretty plastically and uh, uh, not sustaining in the long term versus what we find through the students, which is the sort of slow food or the artisan kind of, of, you know, thinking about the ingredients and sourcing and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that gets you to how there is, you know, how we move from transactional uh, work to uh, students interacting and using these tools to part of a, a normal interaction. Okay, I'll both those. I, I think it's a calculator moment that I'm old enough to remember when calculators first came in how, <clears throat> and how panicked teachers were about. You know, is this going to destroy the need for children to learn arithmetic? In that sense, in that disruptive sense, yes, I think it is. But it's different in that calculators were, are aimed at helping you to be more accurate. AI, I think, is aimed at helping you to be more creative. Um, and if you see them as tools for creativity, not tools for accuracy, then I think it's uh, equally disruptive, but in a different way. And we need to, I think we're going to need to rethink, as we already are, we'll rethink creativity and what it means to be creative. And if an AI can be creative, then what's the implications for human creativity? And I like that idea about, you know, is it a McDonald's moment? Yes, I think you know, slow thinking, uh, collaborative creativity, working together as a team as we are now, sharing ideas, bouncing ideas of ourselves as humans with human experience. Um, I think these are going to be some of the skills which will continue to prosper in a world of AI. If I might, I'll just pick up on one of the questions that came through on uh, Poll Everywhere. What ethical considerations need to be taken into account when using generative AI for academic writing and assessment? I think the main ethical one is that it isn't human. Um, and you know, as humans, we have human experience, but also you know, ethical principles, wherever those ethical principles come from. And so in using AI, the starting point has to be that it doesn't have an ethical framework. Now, having said that, companies like OpenAI are now trying to add an ethical framework onto it um, so one of the things I didn't talk about was that there was an initial training of these systems. The company realized that there were all sorts of issues, not least the fact that it's trained on basically the entire World Wide Web, and the entire World Wide Web is not ethically neutral. It has um, prejudices, um, it has sexist language, um, it has a whole set of ethical issues, which the company then has tried to ameliorate by doing post-training, by getting humans to judge the output from its products, from ChatGPT, and then to say, oh, this is acceptable, this isn't, and to tweak it, to refine it. So the company is going through an ethical um, procedure to try and refine that. And we have to think about what's the basis that that company is using to do that post-training. What are its ethical principles? And the company, OpenAI, has become less open about how it's doing that. So we need to now press these companies on what are the ethical principles that you are using to do that refinement, to do that post-training of your systems, to you know, make sure that they are ethically appropriate. And what do we mean by ethically appropriate? So there are some very deep ethical issues that as academics, but also as members of the human race, we need to, to deal with. And we do need to question the companies as to what are the principles that you are using to develop and to refine your systems. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for one last question or comment. Thank you. I want to ask, uh, I 
Obviously, now probably things were quite straightforward. So you go to AI and CPT, and you would know this was an AI machine, you would get the information. But things are getting quite complicated now because, uh, in an invisible kind of fashion, AI is embedded mm -hmm. in systems to we, we knew as non AI to be now. We said Google would have bought and you know, uh, Microsoft had been. So it's quite a scary landscape for academics who are doing assessment for this. Do you have any recommendation for, for the academic who mm -hmm. is totally lost at the moment, you know? I'm totally scared of how to deal with assessment issues in the future. Yeah. Um, so it is, and it's come very quickly. And I think this is one of the things it's, it's you know, academia is used to moving fairly slowly. It's got a whole set of interlocking systems, and you change one of them, you have to change them all. It's very difficult to make a change to academia. And suddenly this has been pushed upon us. So I think you know it is going to be a you know, a real problem as to how we deal um, with a system like this. Um, and you know, I, I don't really have a simple answer um, to how we can you know, start to manage uh, a a world where um, it's become embedded into tools. So you know if you think about it, you don't ask a student whether they've used a spell checker to write there. No, we wouldn't now think about that. Have you used a word process for, for writing your uh, your assignment? It's just part of what students do. In a few months, uh, and it's going to be months rather than years, I don't think you're going to ask, have you been using generative AI for writing it? Because it will just be part of the way in which we write. And I know it's hard to think about that now, but you know, just imagine the spell checker. You know? You know, all of you, you can't avoid the spell checkers, and you wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't hand in a piece of writing unless I'd spell checked it. I imagine that in a few months, you know, students in particular, but us later, wouldn't hand in a piece of writing unless probably we'd you know, try to see if there was a different way of expressing it, try to see if there was an alternative approach um, using generative AI. So I think we've got to accept that it is going to be part of the toolkit, it's part of the creative toolkit. And, you know, as you said, we need to then rise above that to say, what sort of skills do we need now um, with our students? What sort of critical skills, what sort of evaluative skills, what sort of ethical school skills, and what sort of skills do we need for the future workplace where AI will be an integral part of that workplace? I think that's for, you know, for us to develop that policy together. I don't have the simple answer to that, but I know it's needed. Thanks, Mike. Really stimulating. We, we're closing now, so perhaps we might just thank Mike for his input this morning.